Hey everybody, I'm Sean Robinson. I'm Carson Grubaugh, welcome to Living the Line. And today we've got a real treat for you all and a real treat for me personally. Uh, a man I have not talked to in a very long time, but I very much enjoyed uh, getting to talk to on a regular basis for many years ago. I don't wanna keep that a secret, Jim. Uh, just uh, a per person that it was a privilege to uh, get to kind of peer at from a distance across, uh, across a sandwich uh, occasionally many years ago, um, but a true visionary of the comics field and someone who has been uh, plowing his own furrow for, I mean, at least three decades now in a quite stunning way. And, and Jim, I've always uh, kind of wanted to ask you uh, some things that I never really thought was appropriate to ask in a, in a different kind of conversational setting. And I'm very pleased to have the excuses uh, to be able to uh, pry now. So Jim, thank you very much for talking to us today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Sean. And I missed those days too. That was a lot of fun. Uh, so, so Jim, you have a quite stunning uh, book out now from uh, Fantagraphics. I believe this shipped just a few weeks ago. Uh, One beautiful spring day. Here's my copy right here. Uh, I have uh, placed my dust cover back on for the uh, sake of being able to show everyone the title here. Uh, but when you guys get your copy, I would recommend you remove the dust cover for easy reading. Uh, what a fantastic book. And this is basically the culmination of what would you say, like 10, 10 years worth of uh, effort on your part? Yeah, it took about 10 years overall to draw everything that's in that book. But of course, I wasn't working on only that during that time. Right. And, uh, and Frank, uh, as a character, this, so this uh, book, One Beautiful Spring Day, uh, is, is sort of a, what would you say, like an expanded compendium of the last three uh, Frank uh, graphic novels that you made, and then you've you've uh, stitched them together with different interstitial material that's been added as well. Yeah, expanded compendium says it pretty well. But um, when I did the three books that form the nucleus of One Beautiful Spring Day, I wasn't thinking of them as being part of a you know a three part story or three parts of a longer story or even um, I wasn't even thinking of them as being sequential. Hmm. In fact, after I did Congress of the Animals, and, and I did Fran on the on the title on the title page, it says, I think it says continuing and discontinuing Congress of the Animals, and then in Poochie Town it says discontinuing Fran and Congress of the Animals. So uh, I really didn't think of it as being sequential at all. Um, and when they were all done, I was a little bit, I really didn't know where they were because uh, Congress of the Animals was uh, represented an adventure for me because uh, I had, am I just jumping too deep into this? Because oh. I'll just start, start talking and not stop because it's a <laughs> long, complicated story and I don't want to wear well, your ears out. So maybe I what? should answer it quickly and you can ask another question no no no, no we're no. here for the long we we are let, let me let me insert something because we, we've gotten a few uh complaints recently that uh we we jumped we jump in too much too too much too far too quickly so so just just to sort of interject here so frank has existed as a character for many decades before this and started appearing in the pages of jim i believe the the book that you were doing for fan graphics um and these most three recent graphic novels are essentially the longest form Frank stories uh, that you've done up until this point. So that's that's a fair assessment. That, okay, that, that sums it up nicely. Excellent. But really, in order to explain this, I have to go back a ways and say that you know, from a very early age, I was captivated by and wanted to make spooky, symbolic, evocative pictures. You know, I loved them when I saw them and I just wanted to do that. And it took me until I was in my mid twenties to be able to draw well enough to do anything that I wanted to do. And then I, you know, started making these pictures and uh, making those, I still make them. And it's like any other kind of imaginative drawing. You get an idea, you do some sketches, you work out the composition and you try to think of how to make it stronger or better or whatever it is, and then finally you have a picture. But uh, the first Frank story just dropped into my head complete from nothing. I had the character, Frank had appeared on a magazine cover in a different form, and Manhog, it was in a sketchbook. And something 
some workshop in my mind, just put them together, wrote a story and plunked them in there. So all I really had to do was to draw it. And the rendering style, those wavy lines, that was part of it. I thought, oh, I'll do that like that. And that will. No shading ever crossed. They'll only be parallel to each other. There's no cross hatching at all. And I came up with, I mean, there's like a set of rules and it was so fun and so easy to do. I just started turning them out. And it was, you know, the, I, the stories would just drop into my head one sentence at a time and I'd write them down and then I'd have a story and I'd draw it. So it was a lot of work, but it was no struggle. And I did that from about 1992, oh, for, for 10 years after that, I guess. And then, um, oh no, less than that. But anyhow, uh, I decided I would do some hundred page stories. And so I did a book called Weathercraft, and I like I like the discipline of exactly a hundred pages. So I another story uh, came my way, and I started drawing it. And that story was called Poochie Town, right after uh, Weathercraft. And I had the story, and I started drawing it, and I wasn't interested in it. And I thought, you know, it would be nice if Frank had a companion. I'm going to take him out of the Unifactor, where he lives, and have him you know, have meet a, a significant other, a mate of some sort. And when I did that, the, the process by which the stories were given to me just stopped cooperating. And it took me almost a year to work it out because it was like making one of those spooky drawings from scratch, you know, I had to work it out and hammer it out. There was no, just all of the structure was gone. And I kept pounding away at it. And I used some of the ideas that I had, but they had all been screwed up by the changes that I had made. So it was a big ordeal. And then when it was done, I realized I had torpedoed the whole enterprise because one of the things that drove Frank was the idea that he was alone in this world that he didn't create and where he was taken care of somehow. And he would just get up in the morning and go and explore this place. And now he had a you know, he was as good as married, so he would like sleep in and read the <laughs> papers and, you know, goof off, you know. And so at that point, uh, the voice of the Unifactor said, okay, here's how we will deal with this. We'll get rid of her in this way. And I thought, oh, this is good. And then after, after I had done Fran, which explains, which gets rid of Fran basically from the storyline, I realized that there were all kinds of clues as to what Fran was in Congress of the Animals that I hadn't put in there. When you visit her at her house, she's got a miniature model of his house with the Pupshawn Pushpaw inside it. Right. And it's like, why that was there, I don't know. That was, you know, that was me getting a little bit of information from outside and plugging it in there. And there are other things like that too. And it, in retrospect, it provides a foreshadowing for the idea that Fran is not what she seems, that she has a lot more control over this situation, that she's doing something deliberately. None of that read in the initial book, but in light of what happened, it's it just, it just there's a, a synchronicity and an overall control connected to these stories that just astonishes me when I see it. And so then I went back to the original title and I did the book Poochie Town, but it, like the other books, was uh, it's, it's a spam call. <laughs> um, oh yeah, so uh, I started working on uh, Poochie Town and when that was done, it was, uh, I really didn't know what I had there because it was unlike all the other Frank stories, it, 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 there's a structure to all the other stories. They start out in a certain way, something happens, something else happens and everything is restored. It's like a rhythm to all these things. And there are other constants too. There's a new, at least one new character introduced into every story. There's always a moral. There's always a pun. They're just, the structure of these stories contains these things. And Poochie Town did not. And, uh, and then when the next batch of information came in, what to do, it was like, it was this all, it was almost like a punchline. It was a joke. It was like going to be work that material information that would contextualize that three story nucleus. It would undo my crime of screwing around with the format. 
it would explain why everything that happened happened and it would contain the 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 information that it was all building towards is there in in this book and again it was just you know me transcribing what came along and when the whole thing was finished you know i didn't i didn't read it or look at it as i was doing it i didn't really look at it until i got a pdf from fanographics that put the whole thing <laughs> and i was just you know i was just astonished at all the stuff that's built into this book that i didn't intend to be there um and beyond i mean i can give you examples if you want but that's that's the long and short of it that this book is is, is not only a big mystery to me but it's relevant to me in ways that are so personal and so deep and so instructive that the doing of this book, the having of this book, the completing of this book has given me, it's, it's significant in a much deeper way than just finishing this story. I've learned something about myself and about the world and about the past and about the future from doing this. It's been like a long, not exactly a guided meditation, but and like a paying job creating an instruction manual for myself and my future. A real gift. Well, and, and it reads that way. I mean, I, I, I had read um, two of the three books out of, you know, in, in the original published uh, sequence. I mean, and it, it's just, they're not comparable at all. I mean, I, and I don't mean that. Th this is in its completed, uh, form, I mean, something completely different. I mean, I, I think that that is that's clear to, as a reading experience as well. Um, and and I don't I, I don't know how if I've ever read something that has the sort of um, depth of meaning along with the sort of surface engagement that these two things could be so far from each other. Um, and and what about I mean is 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 that the sort of you know, you, you've pushed your 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 sort of initial. Uh, yeah, I'm a, <laughs> uh, I read this with a half of it with my four year old, um, and he had great insight into it continually. He sat on my lap. It wasn't like you know he was still like semi engaged. He like got as close as he could, and he was narrating for me. I point so that he knew which direction the panel's going, and he was narrating for me what the characters were. We're going through and he was like alarmed at at Fran, uh, you know, various points in the thing. I mean, he was just like, you know, he, he seemed to intuit the sort of underlying meaning uh, in a way that I was not prepared to. I just thought I was going to show him a few pictures and he would go wander off and do something else. But <laughs> it, was a, it was a very interesting thing because, I mean, I feel like it's an incredibly deep uh, work. Uh, and yet your your sort of ability to engage with it in a sort of like almost like a slapstick format on a page to page basis while keeping the thread over a 400 page work is really remarkable. I feel the same way about it. You know, I feel I can praise this book openly because I can't take credit for the cleverness of it. You know, I really just, you know, I spent a long, long time sitting at the drawing board. And a lot of the pages, there are some two page spreads in there that I drew two or three times entirely. Just, I would get one done and I go, oh, that could be a little better. And I would just, with no trauma, no sense of, oh, God damn it, I wasted all this time. I would just get <laughs> a paper and start over again. It was just this flow that is unlike me. So it's been a, and I have found things tucked away in there. There's a sentence tucked away in that book written in English. <laughs> There's uh, one obvious piece of synchronicity that I point out is the title. When my son was young, I used to tell him stories and I would always start them out, one beautiful spring day. And the, the, the titles of these stories like Weathercraft, I don't know what that means, or Poochie Town, or, you know, they just, titles come and I go, okay, that's the title. And so this one, one beautiful spring day, I had that idea from the moment I started drawing it. And I assumed it came from that. And then I had it all lettered out and I was looking at it and there's the words one day <laughs> jumping out at me. And that just astonished me because that's, that's one of the, one of the drivers of the story. 
And it's also connected to the uh, uh, there's, I guess, you know, one thing we all learned from Hero with a Thousand Faces is that uh, we're surrounded by elements of myth. But there are a lot of, I wouldn't say references to, but echoes of classical famous myths, a lot of uh, Buddhist and Christian and Vedantic, not a lot, but they're in there. You know, there's some, some very definite Vedantic things, some things that are almost illustrations of Buddhist aphorisms. I don't know. I, I again, it's it's so much. Well, it's a freaky thing. I don't know how else to put it. It's a, it's an astonishing book to me. Well, the 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 title um, just in and of itself. I mean, the the fact that this is a something that you used to use to tell your child uh, stories. Um, I mean, would also suggest to me that perhaps this is also part of the message of the title, and that you are receiving this story from a mm -hmm. older or more experienced intelligence that you know, cares about, or, or, or Frank is, I mean, just the, the, there's a scale shift implication to me uh, that this is the phrase that you used to tell a story to your kid and that you're now feeling like a mediator of a story as well, you know? That could be, that could be. I definitely haven't unpacked everything that's in there. I'm, I'm curious, Jim, when you're talking about getting like these downloads of information, it almost sounded like some of your description of that sounded like it's linguistic. You said I get a sentence. Is it is it more well, linguistic or is it more visual? It's it's well, it, it's not visual at all. It's uh, one thing I, I realized about myself is that when I read, if I read a story and it says a blonde woman sat at a wooden desk in an office, I don't visualize it. I mm. store that information away. So I. I, I don't really visualize when I read and I don't really visualize what's happening while I'm writing it. Hmm. It's, uh, this happens, this happens, it's all information. And I'll write, yeah. Frank, uh, Frank wakes up in the morning and there's this, there's this sense you get, you know, when you're, when you're surprised by a really good piece of surrealism or something that really grabs you the first time you see a Magritte or a De Carico and you suddenly realize that this is doing this extraordinary thing. That's that feeling that I, I've, I often think of that feeling as being a kind of perceiving an invisible glow. Mm -hmm. It's like fluorescence. You can't see fluorescent light, but it activates certain things so you can sense its presence. It's like this thing is reflecting something heavy back at me. And you really see that in the best surrealism. You have some unprecedented, irrational image, like the Song of Love by Georgia de Carico, and it's just so powerful, and you can't figure out why. If you're obviously seeing or experiencing something more than just that collection of objects, they add up in some poetic way to remind you of something. They have that phrase, nostalgia for the infinite, I think, to capture that feeling. And something similar happens here when the, the first sentence is Frank wakes up in the morning. Okay, that's good. It stays. He uh, stays in bed. No, that's not good. Cross it out. He gets up. Go. He goes outside. Go. He heads towards the water. No, no glow. Heads for the hills. Okay, glow. He goes to the hills. And that's it just unfolds. I just write down sentences, not using the ones that don't work. And at the end, I have a story with a beginning and a middle and an end and a point and everything. And then it's more like dowsing uh, then? Well, it's not like dowsing. It's more like just being receptive. I mean, this the stuff is maybe it's it's more like uh, if you have some sort of obsession that won't leave you alone and it's always percolating in the back of your mind. And when your mind is relaxed, it comes out. It's more like mm -hmm. that. Find yourself yeah. thinking about something you didn't intend to think about. And when you look at it, it's a whole narrative. That your mind has been quietly spinning in the background that you haven't really been paying attention to it's more like that that's that's fascinating to me because when i when i look at your work i, I i'm someone who also thinks in language i have no visual component to my inner life at all but i look at your work and i think this is a guy that's just 
like pumping like hyper fantasia in his head all the time where he's like seeing this stuff so to hear that you get it linguistically is a in encouraging to me <laughs> but also when you reference surrealism i start thinking about the crossover of image and language where they're almost uh, like language has entendre built into it and surrealism figured out how to do entendre with visuals um so that's that's inter really interesting to me to hear you talk about that yeah and i'm meet, meeting you for the first time jim uh, uh having read uh you know a couple hundred pages of your comics before that point uh i was very surprised at how you know you're you're an extremely articulate uh person i mean you don't need me to tell you this i'm saying this for the benefit of people who are listening you know at, at, you know yeah i was shocked the first time i saw um your one of your scripts and i was like a script these characters have names, you know, like I didn't it, it, I, I didn't realize that you engage linguistically like that. And it's a very interesting, uh, you know, thing because of how intensely visual ob obviously your pantomime comics are. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it, it, the thing that I, I don't want to sort of pass by here is that the engagement, visual engagement uh, with the the Frank world and, and the fact that you identified this, the first Frank story that you were drawing uh, that you have built into the to the building blocks of the visual frank language that is there in basically every single story um is uh both the sort of i'm gonna call it lowbrow for the for the lack of a better term but the sort of early animation uh cartooning uh anthropomorphic animal uh style combined with a sort of uh hyper like blown up um let's let's call it for the lack of a better term once again uh highbrow uh etching technique uh specifically like the non-touching parallel lines like you're identified it's almost like we're looking at like a max ernst blow up of uh you know a, a collage um you, using woodcut elements um and so you've got these sort of things that like are obviously like visually pleasing to you or you wouldn't do them over and over again but also like when you when you have this kind of engagement it's almost like a, a totally unique visual presentation that is combining these two disparate elements and that's like seems to me like that is the strength of the writing as well um you know wh whether this is you know the 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 fact that you have this depth but also the sort of like i was saying the pantomime has a reputation of being you know at least in this past two centuries pet pantomime and that type of thing has a reputation of being like a low art uh flat <laughs> regardless of the depth of that in, in, in a historical traditional sense you know um i wish i had framed that as a question uh <laughs> well go ahead <laughs> uh, is that true uh <laughs> no but i mean it'd be interesting to hear about like like from the spiritual standpoint because this seems to be spiritual or psychological revelations of some sort to you um, that combination of the, the the kind of like elevated and the low seems to have a spiritual component to it. So it'd be interesting to hear you talk about that if it matters at all. I don't know. Well, I think it matters a great deal, but it's very difficult to talk about it. And most people aren't interested in it. Hmm. We are. <laughs> well, well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, Well, let me see if I can find a good point of entry here. Um, boy, I had a thought in my mind and it just dropped out. Uh, maybe, maybe, well, uh, why don't you say something while I'm wool gathering here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There, there just seems to be something about that duality that Sean's poking at um, that that seems so important to your work that you've got like like the mickey mouse kind of old cartoon mixed with the high art and this this kind i don't know i mean you go to as above so below you know when you're talking about mysticism as well that also seems like a good entry point into that concept that sean's poking at as above so below well it's it's uh you know, again, this is this is a subject that interests interests me intensely. I my spiritual endeavors, spiritual philosophy, thinking about that sort of thing, reading about that sort of thing, is 
is my primary interest in life. Yeah. There's no other area of investigation that intrigues me as much as profound introspection and philosophical speculation on the nature of reality. And it's inevitable. One of the things, I can tell you two things that are related to that, that, that are connected with this book. And one is that, like I said, when I did Congress of the Animals, I screwed up. I inserted myself into the story. I disrupted the flow. I had to do a lot of work to counter that. And it ended up being kind of cataclysmic. And when I, when I did Poochie Town, I had to make amends for that by redrawing the first six pages of Congress of the Animals exactly, line for line. You can't tell them apart looking at them casually. They look like the exact same pages, except on page six of that sequence, in the original of all the things that have been dropped from the balloon, right. they focus upon a uh, croquet set. In the new version, they go past the croquet set to this instrument. And I had to do that over again, that sequence to make clear the distinction that this wasn't the same sequence. This mm -hmm. looks like it, it's identical in some ways, but it's different. It's like the same river twice kind of thing. And that was my way of setting myself <clears throat> straight. That was my way of atoning for what I had done wrong and getting it back on the track. But when I had the 100 new pages to recontextualize the whole story, I realized that it had taken this mistake that I had made and turned it into something intentional because it was part of this deliberate vision that had been foisted upon Frank in order to prevent him. I don't know if it's clear, but he was going to cut his throat. Right. Very subtle. He was talked out of that by this whole experience. So that episode with Fran and in Congress of the Animals, that becomes an intentional thing. That turns, that takes my, and it's a magnificent thing. It's a, it drives the story inward and outward simultaneously. I mean, it just does wonderful things for the story. So it took my gross blunder and turned it into this shining artistic attribute, this stroke of brilliance, this wonderful thing to enjoy and appreciate. That's like magic. Yeah. Changing the past. And the other thing it did for me is there's a sequence near the end <clears throat> where Frank is dreaming. And there's like 10 levels of consciousness starting with the readers. And it goes in and in and in and in. And at one point, he's confronted with a message. And the message is he doesn't exist. Or at least he's shown the direction that reaches that. And when that had that dawned on me, I had this realization that I don't exist. I do not exist. If I look deeply into myself for to try to find myself, I'm not there. All that's there is this idea that I exist. It's ahamkara, as they call it. And all the other ideas are attached to that. There's no me, there's no shining red bean at the middle to which attributes are added. There's nothing. And this book showed me that in a way that made me able to realize it in this shining intense way for a few seconds. <clears throat> so that's another spiritual aspect of the thing. When, when you have an experience like that and you say for a few seconds, um, but then obviously you like have to kind of come back to real life. What, what level of ability do you have to maintain that few none. seconds? None, 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 none. Those are the well-known fruits of meditation. You get glimpses yeah. and they're, you, you real I, you know, it's, if they stayed, you'd be a different person, hmm. but you, I'm, have I'm, them, you see them and then they just melt away. Like when you're trying to remember a dream and you have it, and then it just vanishes from your mind. It's like that but you remember that there was something there. You remember the intensity of what you felt. You remember the kind of, you remember thinking, if I have to express this in words, what would I say? Or you think, oh, the clear light of the void. I understand what that means now. People, you know, these are real common small experiences that people have, you know. 
people I've, who... I've always struggled with that because like in, in philosophy, which I've done a lot, I have a degree in that and have done a lot of reading, you get the cogito ergo sum, the I think therefore I am. And that lasted for a long time. But then at, at some point, I forget which philosopher it was, but they come back and they they say like Descartes got it wrong. Like you can't say there's an I there. The most you can say is that there's thinking going on. And that's always been really, really hard for me to grasp because I've never been able to let go of that sense of I yet. I, th I think you're not supposed to let go of it easily. I think you're, it's, it's very, very hard to shake. You have to devote a lot of time to getting past it. And I think it's, there's also an aspect of this, uh, you know, the, the special theory of relativity, E equals MC squared. I remember about 15 years ago, I had two books by Stephen Hawking, which talked about this, uh, the theory of relativity. And they, he, he explains it through all kinds of um, thought experiments and analogies. And there's the falling elevator and the speeding train and the light moving at the speed of light and all this stuff. But knowing those things, hearing those things, reading those things doesn't give you really an understanding what, of what E equals MC squared means. And I decided, well, I'm, there's something there that I'm not getting. This is like somebody trying to describe something that can't be described that has to be understood intuitively. So I devoted myself for a couple of days to trying to understand it. And in a flash of insight, I got it. I understood, I remember the moment I thought, well, then why is time the only thing that is constant? That doesn't make sense. And then it, I realized, no, of course that doesn't make sense because it's not true. It appears constant to us, which means everything else is relative. And I just saw it. <laughs> I, I, I stood up, I was so shocked by this realization, you know? And I, I think that there, there, are, there must, I mean, how many things like that must there be that we're getting information about it? You know, especially I, th I think of it, you know, the Buddha, I'm not a Buddhist, but he's saying these things, he's pointing towards experience, he's saying, think about this, here's, a, here's an analogy, here's a simile, here's, you know, we can't address it directly, so I'm giving you all of this circumlocution, and you need to think about it, and if you think about it the right way, you will understand it, because it's knowledge that can be had, you just have to go after it in a different way. Yeah, maybe and, that's, oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say that we're, we must be surrounded by things like that, things that we just get little clues about and that we hear about. We just, uh, you know, we're so far from understanding it that we can't see a path to understanding it. And so we kind of languish in this very reductive state where, especially in this culture, any kind of, you know, everything is so off the shelf now, you know, almost everything yeah. you hear is a reflection of what's in the media or, <laughs> or something. Yeah, very little independent thinking going on out there right now, I think. Well, and, and maybe that's the strength uh, of the, uh, it, the the pantomime approach might uh, uh, facilitate the uh, fable uh, aspect. Um, you know, if you think about a fable as a vehicle for, um, you know, higher wisdom uh, instead of just a simple story that can engage uh, somebody in an immediate basis. It's almost like these, these things are kind of carrying each other, like Frank exists in a, the visual state that he's in because he's carrying both the fable and the pantomime uh, with him, which is why you can get both the surface engagement with the book and the deep level realizations that you can get from having something that takes you through, you know, a sequence of, you know, I mean, Frank has personal devolvement. He has, you know, transformation. He has, uh, you know, he, he's that kind of hard headed character where he doesn't actually always or almost never learn from. Right. Yeah. He never does learn. Right. He's the vehicle for our learning right. rather than being, you know, I think his visual, the, the, the thing I was trying to get to before is that the visual component perfectly serves that same kind of engagement where you, you know the easy engagement of the of the surface leads to the deeper engagement um and you no, know, I, I, but i just want to interject something that yeah. you were talking about you know this cartoon seeming to have some resonance i think that that is authority 
You know, when your doctor tells you you don't have cancer, it means more than when your wife tells you. And the, uh, the voice, the, the, the author of these stories, the point behind it, the lesson that's trying to emerge is, has real authority. And I think that's what makes this book work. It's not it's not me trying to think of funny things that might happen. There's a real thing behind this that is trying to make itself known. And I, I, it's, it's, I'm surprised that it kind of works, you know. I, I would expect that a lot of people would look at this and go, you know, this is a long, this is a lot of cartoon hijinks that don't make a lot of sense. I don't know why I need to get involved in this quagmire. Except that people have told me, and I've experienced it myself, you start looking at it, and you go, oh, this, is, this means something. This is going somewhere. Something's happening in here. And that is entirely, you know, not my doing. Not my so not my doing so you you really think like your sense of this is that there is some i don't want to say a higher being or something like that but you think about it on kind of like you're being communicated to from the outside rather than that this is like you've just gotten really good at letting your subconscious give you some kind of like universal truths in in a more like collective subconscious sense versus some kind of like entity communicating I wouldn't try to say what it is or it isn't. You know, it just okay. happened like everything else in the world. I don't understand it. I don't know where it came from. I don't know why it's in my life. I don't I don't understand any of it. And I don't really know what's going on here. Obviously, this is not coming from entirely outside myself. This is some aspect of me talking to another aspect of me. I guess you could say it's my subconscious talking to my conscious. That, that rings true. That's right. I mean, we all have hidden depths. So... I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. The mystery of it is uh, the mystery of everything is one of, you know, they, I like that more in life than anything else. And it, it's viscerally different for you working on these than working on another story, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. 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 Like I say, it's no struggle at all. It's a lot of work. Um, taking those sentences and, you know, roughing them out, making page breaks and then doing all these pages over and everything. It's a lot of work, but it goes smoothly. There's no drama. There's no panic. There's no, why did I embark upon this, this long, <laughs> tedious voyage? I feel like I, when I start one of these books, I feel like I'm getting onto a boat with no luggage. And I don't know where I'm going. But it's, you know, and, and lots of, you know, I'm working on a painting now. I'm supposed to have a show here in October and I'm doing a painting for it. And it's just miserable for me. <laughs> not a painter. And this thing has taken up way too much of my time. And it's, it's a mediocrity, which is worse than a total failure. It just exposes the weakness of my artistic endeavor. And it really bothers me. But I never had an experience like that when I was working on the Frank stuff. Never. Hmm. Interesting. Easy. You, your engagement with it, uh, you know, I, I asked you pr prior to us talking and I mentioned meditation and line because it seems as though, uh, you know, you have fallen into a, uh, whether it's the actual physical movements or the, or the look of it or whatever. I mean, you have uh, both a very specific um, technique and also it seems a uh, sort of palette of uh, techniques to, to draw from for these particular stories. Like, do you find that the, the actual physical physicality of it is meditative for you? Well, it isn't meditative for me because I'm usually listen to hmm. something. And my, if I find it easier for me to do the inking, if I have half my mind on something else, kind of like when you're driving, you know, Mm -hmm. the yeah. part of your mind that's always weighing spatial connections and relative speeds of other cars and you're not conscious of it and so I'll, I'll listen to something and then at the end of the day i have a picture right and and if if you had not gotten the facility that you have with your you know you talked about being in your 20s and finally getting to the point where you had the facility to do the things that you wanted to do what do you think I mean, I don't want you to speculate too much, but I mean, what would you what would you do with the energy that you have that that comes out with this facility? I mean, because what, what have you ever had any kind of frustration in terms of temporarily losing that facility 
Uh, oh, you mean like a block? Sure, or a physical issue or anything like that. Um, well, my hand isn't as steady as it was. It's harder for me to do pen and ink. And same with my eyes, it's harder for me to gauge spatial relationships. So it's harder for me to keep a consistent distance between lines than it used to be. Hmm. But I can still rally and do it. When that power goes, I'll, uh, there will be something else. Really, if, if I didn't have, if I never learned how to draw or create or do the things that I wanted to do, I don't know what I would have ended up doing, but what I would have wanted to do would be to uh, completely find a way to devote my life to uh, introspection, hmm. you know, to do that kind of work instead of another. I do a yeah. lot of that as it is, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm able to, I've been able to make a living doing these drawings and things, real fortunate, and that is not lost on me, but uh, I'm not super choosy about what kind of experiences I have. I just as soon go to the supermarket as go to Disneyland. So I can find something. It, it seems like the art gives you the space for the introspection. I mean, that, that, that seems like with the Frank stuff and the way you talk about it entirely the case. Something that me and Sean have been talking about a lot over the last three months because of this new art making AI stuff. Um, and when we talked to Dave McKean about that, something that we, are making. Yeah, that was an interesting conversation. I enjoyed that a lot. Oh, thank you. And the, the thing that stuck with me about that, and then your work seems particularly, you know, I'm interested to hear what you think about it, is the the spiritual spirituality of the making versus like the, the in, kind of interpretive spirituality of the audience, because that's something that talking to him has highlighted for me is that I really need to focus on the making. And when I talk to my students, I need to focus on that aspect of the making. Um, and, and I do think that like, even when, if I hadn't had that conversation with Dave, I would come to your work more from like trying to interpret the spirituality out of it, you know, trying to receive the message. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear you just talk about if you have any sense at all about the difference between those two states, the making state and kind of the engaging with the finished product state. I'm not entirely sure I know what you mean. The difference between making something and and seeing it after it's made. Well, yeah, yeah and the, the different mind states of, you know, you're talking about this kind of deep introspection that I assume the art making kind of gives space for uh is like a kind of different space of introspection than me sitting there with one beautiful spring day and kind of interpreting what you oh yeah made. yeah well i guess that uh, the my my artwork reflects my interest in introspection and uh there i, I have come to feel that uh i've come to it, it sounds corny to say it but i've come to feel that uh the, the opportunity to do this work and the opportunity to make a living off of it has been uh, something of a gift, you know? One of the things I realized when I realized I don't exist is that, you know, I, I don't know how it is for other people, but I came into this world with no idea of how I got here. I didn't design my body or my parents. I just found myself in a situation where everything was being given to me. And I just had it to manipulate it. And immediately I started thinking, you know, when some little thing happened that I didn't like, I go, who do you think you were dealing with here? I'd be indignant. You know, I just came to this world, had everything handed to me. And if somebody looked at me cross-eyed, I'd be outraged. It didn't, didn't, you know, and I look at it like that, it doesn't make a lick of sense to me. And that, that sense of things has stayed as something that I really got from this, from contemplating this book. I mean, I saw myself almost like Frank, placed into a world that I didn't create, thinking that I'm the king of this place and I can do whatever I want and I have autonomy. But obviously, I have no autonomy, no choice. Free will is a joke. You know, I'm at the mercy of God knows what, but I have no freedom none i don't i don't think my own thoughts i don't contribute anything to the world 
I don't create artwork, you know. So I wanted, I had the impulse and suddenly art materials came to me. I was able to do anything. I'm just manipulating stuff that's here. And that this that is doing that is just this impulse. It couldn't happen if I didn't believe in myself. I was constantly aware of the fact that I don't exist and that this is all just a construct and that I'm something else. I wouldn't be able to do anything. There'd be no personal reason for it. So I have to uh, find a way to live that is consonant with that understanding, even if I don't have that realization. You know, the gulf between realization and understanding is profound. That action, being able to act upon any of it, yeah. Well, action. I mean, that's where that's 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 easy for us. We can act all the time. That's what we can do. What we can't do is uh, want to be smarter and be smarter. <laughs> want yeah. to, you know, we can see, oh, that guy's smarter than me. I wish I was smarter than him, but you can't do it. You can't make it happen. At least, not immediately. Yeah. You know, the, the, the first time that uh, it ever occurred to me that Frank is essential, you know, could be seen as an analog of the, you know, modern human experience in the sense of having, you know, sorted our environment in a certain kind of sense and having things provided for us was the, the sequence uh, about mid book where uh, he has his his home, his domicile uh, rebuilt by the gentleman who comes and then takes him to the factory uh, when he has nothing to present. Um, and uh, I was I was very interested to to read that uh, sequence and sort of see the sort of industrial aspect of the you know uh, uh, s s hitherto uh, you know unknown uh, industrial aspect of it and uh, uh, you know it seems like having the long the longer sequence like that has it enabled you or you know the you, you sort of stretch those boundaries a lot more you know like you said he's actually leaves the world. Um, and, uh, I, I guess it, it hadn't occurred to me before that, 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 that was the type it hadn't occurred to me how much we are in that state in a certain sense. And it's very interesting to hear you, uh, directly relate to that. Do you, do you relate to Frank? Do you think that Frank is an analog to your experience? You know, I didn't used to, Okay. but more and more I see inescapable similarities he's uh one thing he's he's not a noble creature by any means he's uh he he's got he's got some pretty shabby character traits so i can relate to that <laughs> and i can relate to getting up early in the morning and jumping out of bed and wanting to greet the day and i can relate to the idea that uh just going through the day is a voyage of uh encounters with interesting things, you know, that are always fighting to stay in your consciousness, even as your consciousness is fighting to put them aside so it can go on to something else. There's this, this the whole thing is fascinating. And I guess Frank and I both feel that. I don't know, I don't really want to look too closely at it. And I really don't want to get people to Frank is purely a, an expression of myself. I, I think probably everything that Frank experiences and feels is something everybody experiences and feels on some level. That whole spooky, subconscious, symbolic, um, metaphysical thing is not of interest to everybody. There's a lot of people who just don't have any inclination to be introspective in that way. But when you speak in these kind of universal archetypes, there there comes across a relatable lesson. I mean, I don't think everyone's going to go pick up Frank and like try and relate to it because people, yeah, don't deal with surrealism. But anyone who did, I think, would find something in there that relates to their day to day experience, whether they're relate, whether they're interested in like deep metaphysical thoughts or anything like that. Um, you know, like you said, even you, you could enjoy going to the, the grocery store and there seems to be moments of that kind of thing in these works as well. Well, yeah, I think that's true, too. You mentioned uh, old cartoons. There's a Fleischer Brothers cartoon mm -hmm. called Bimbo's Initiation. 
that I saw when I was a little kid back when, you know, if you wanted, if you saw something on TV, it came and went, you had no other way to see it again. But I, I saw this when I was five or six, I guess. And I, it formed one of the cornerstones of my philosophy in life. I mean, it's, it's a deep, rich, mysterious cartoon. It's also a, you know, a silly ass Fleischer Brothers cartoon, but there are elements in it. And that I, the people who made it, I think, had some sense that they were getting into deep waters. There's a, a part where he's in this subterranean basement where there's all these great symbolic things going on. And the music is Orpheus in the Underworld. Mm -hmm. Put that in there deliberately. So they are obviously thinking more interestingly than the cartoons themselves would seem to convey. And uh, I've wrestled with that for years and years. Is there anything really in that cartoon? Does that symbolism actually point to anything real? Fishes, water, stairs, up, down, fear, redemption, all that stuff is in that cartoon. And obviously they have, you know, serious counterparts in the real world. I, I, I guess, I know that cartoon is important to a lot of other people too. They, they will cite that as an early metaphysical influence on them. My conclusion is that there's something there. There is some kind of authority of reality behind this that people are responding to. You know, in the same way that one surrealist painting, you take two completely unprecedented irrational images and one will be really profound and the other won't do anything. You go, oh, that's phony. That's not real surrealism. That's paring knife surrealism. It doesn't do anything yeah that cartoon bimbo's initiation does something there's something in there that is uh meaningful come and find out well uh, sean the fact that your four-year-old sat there and had the same experience with jim's work it, like that's the kind of thing where it's you know that that is like you're you know you've touched on some universal truth yeah. if a four-year-old's interpreting it right because they're still in that state they haven't had like life glommed on exactly. it exactly yeah, i'm paying it forward I, I, I was gonna say your 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 anecdote earlier uh i don't want to trivialize it as an anecdote but i'm for want of a better word uh of, of realizing that you don't exist um and and continuing the conversation about the 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 a truth being a truth at whatever level it's engaged at. Uh, I explained cells to my seven year old. Uh, he was very curious about how cells work and well, what's the tiny, you know, what, and, and we talked about it and I drew some pictures for him. And it was it was probably five minutes between me explaining what a cell was to him saying, well, I, then I'm not the living thing. It's the cells that are the living thing. Wow. Uh, and yeah. wow, that's heavy. <laughs> and, yeah. and I just I I mean I didn't know what to say to him because on one hand like he's he's incredible he's 100% correct uh, on the other hand it's maladaptive for him to have that <laughs> as yeah. a continuing experience I didn't I didn't say anything at all you know I just let him you know sit in that realization but uh, it, it it it's it's I think that that's a similar kind of thing where you know you're the the Fleischer Brothers cartoon is is engaging you at whatever level that you're at um and and the true thing is going to be a true thing no matter which section of it that you're seeing uh at the moment there, the scale shift that's happening in some in in uh, one beautiful spring day that the one particular sequence where the you know the giant uh presumably a giant shrinks down uh to to frank scale and engages with them and then later we see the same character uh having done a particular action shrink down again until he's not visible uh anymore i mean th that combined with the recursive elements really seems to me to bring a level of profundity to the story that you know like you were saying like tying all of these different elements up simultaneously i don't know even know if i've seen that kind of recursion in a story uh before uh, it gave me like a slight feelings of like uneasiness the first time as a kid when I read a choose your own adventure and I realized that each of the endings were simultaneously existing in the same book <laughs> yeah right you know and 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 just the, the the profundity of it was not immediately apparent I mean I probably read 50 of those books before I was like well this is really genuinely weird that these all exist at the same time you know uh, there's something about comics 
that's that's kind of similar um, in that same sense in that you know your Frank if he's in agony for one panel is in agony eternally uh, because we can always go back and look that's true you know yeah yeah it's not it, the, like that that recursion unless, thing. Uh, Oh, sorry, we're getting some unless, glitches. We had a funny sound thing happen. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah you, go and, ahead. Unless. Well, let me tell you something about that yeah. scene where the, where he, that was, uh, the idea there was reverse perspective. The closer he gets, the smaller he gets. Right. So he's big in the distance and small up close. Interesting. That would be a weird way to live. <laughs> we would adapt, though, I'm sure. Yeah, we would. We would find a way. The brains are plastic enough. Um, the idea of recursion that Sean was mentioning, uh, you said that the, the guy in the balloon that drops the thing, that was probably the most impactful moment in the book for me. And I immediately wrote a note about recursion in there. And it was something about that recursion that was super chilling to me when I read it. So to hear you say that that scene was your scene that you had to do could, could, could to atone for <laughs> the sin of introducing Fran makes it more chilling um, and more interesting. But that recursion kind of comes, there's a lot of things that recur in the book. Um, was there, when you look at that, is that also some moment of revelation that you could extrapolate on? When I look at what? Like, like this idea of recursion in your work. Like, is there something profound in that or is that just uh, incidental? Well, it, it's not it's not something that happens consciously. I mean, the, the, the stories structure themselves in the short run and the long run, according to no plan of my own. So I can't really say. Hmm. Okay. It, we, we should clarify too the, the actual moment that you you deviated from is that that you you as the as the you know semi author stepping in uh, was that moment the that they picked up a croquet set uh, or no it was before I actually started drawing it okay. I had the whole script in hand and it was uh, going to be a different story entirely okay and I just thought you know I want to do this. I'm getting a little bored with drawing these stories like this. Shame to relate. That's what mm -hmm. I felt. And I just, you know, it's like when you're a little kid and you have a record player, you listen to records for a while and then you start putting things on it and see how quickly you can spin it before they fly off. You start trying to find other things to do with it. And I guess that's what I was doing here. I was just trying to find some way to make this more enjoyable for me consciously than just being the servant of this process. Right. Yeah. Uh, it was a big mistake, but then it turned out to be a great story element. So, right. It was and, an interesting meta element, an interesting aspect of the whole development of the thing. I mean, there's, there's, I don't know, the whole thing enchants me. Do, do you think that there are other ways that you could violate it other than, uh, other than <laughs> shifting the story? Like if you were to draw it in charcoal or, you know, um, attempt to make like an animated feature or something where you were directly engaged in it. Do you think that that would be a, a violation as well? Do you think that? No, 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 no. I, I think any, any, no, any, any, I could paint them or draw them and do them in charcoal or whatever. That, that doesn't really matter. Gotcha. Doing, I just have to make myself subservient to the mood and try to get it across as best I can. There are, there are parts in, uh, well, never mind. So it's it's the narrative, like if something is uh, you are inserting something into a narrative, that's when the yeah. kind of sin is committed. Okay. Yeah, it changed the the focus. It changed the point. I made something happen that that shouldn't have happened. It was like when Lil Abner got married. That was a big fiasco. <laughs> or if uh, John Steed and oh, I'm using all these archaic references. You know what I'm saying. There's a certain tension, you know. It's like season eight of Game of Thrones for a more. <laughs> getting Veronica, you know, if any of the, if any of those became a couple, it would destroy the whole thing. Yeah, right. Because the delicate balance is yeah. between these objects interacting with each other. Yeah. Changing the the path of one of the objects is a violation of the central conceit. 
and closing an open system mm. full of potential and saying that existed to produce this. And then you've got, you're out of that state and into a cause and effect. So uh, it, it's interesting to me, uh, Carson and I have, uh, have talked a lot about uh, the primacy of line uh, and the sort of foundational aspect of line in terms of, uh, you know, human art making, it seems like that's the typical first thing that somebody does uh, when they're young is they make, a, you know, whether you're drawing with a stick in the ground or anything like that. And, uh, you know, accepting the idea that there can be multiple modal explanations for the same phenomenon. Uh, we talked to a neurologist uh, who was able to provide some information as to why uh, line is actually processed much more efficiently in the brain. Uh, specifically that the higher the contrast that something is and the more it uh, resembles an edge, the speedier the visual processes are oh, to goodness. engage the brain. Um, so accepting that that is the sort of neurological or physical explanation or even physiological explanation, is there a spiritual, in, in your estimation, a, a spiritual component at all to engagement with line. I mean, there's so many different cultures that use the decorative arts as a means of inducing meditation uh, or inducing a sort of a spiritual element. It seems to me that it's it, there's something about the line itself that is has its own kind of gravitas. Um, I, I, do you agree with that or am I off base? Well, I like the line. I like drawing. I like to look at drawings and admire how people use line. I don't know what could replace the line. I think we're stuck with it and it can be analyzed, but I don't think there's a substitute. So it kind of is what it is. Well, when you, said you, were... you said about uh, hard edges communicating more immediately and directly, it makes me think of an artist like Heinrich Clay, yeah. who uses so many lines that it, they're kind of soft and they yeah. take on a much more thoughtful quality than a pure outline does. Just the evidence of all that work going in there to create these modulated shapes makes it a more nuanced message that it communicates, it seems to me. Yeah, the, I, th I think the first time that uh, I engaged with that as a intellectual pursuit, like a, as a practical pursuit, I mean, the first drawings that I did as a kid were, you know, I mean, uh, sticks on the in the dirt and, you know, marks on paper and things like that, where the line was the primary thing. Uh, but the first time I ever had an intellectual engagement with that was sort of like Scott McCloud's argument that when line approaches text and that somehow you're, 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 you're merging the two or get the two or getting closer together, the verbal and the uh, visual as, as, a, as a line, because it more closely resembles the way that we take in text. And uh, it was just interesting to me to, to find that there's actual a neurological explanation for that kind of phenomenon. The same reason that you don't see everything printed in red. You know, you can put just, you know, God's word in red right. in your Bible and it's fine. But if you read everything in red all the time, it would be fatiguing and slower than taking it in. It okay. seems like that there is some kind of, you know, power that line has that the tone does not or tone engages a different part of us you know maybe tone is a more intellectual engagement as opposed to a visceral engagement um well i've never thought about it like that scott mcleod is somewhat too deep for me but now that you know seriously he's he's a real free-range thinker that guy but uh um now that you mention it, I guess when you're laying out a comic and figuring out where the words will go and figuring out their relative size and saying, oh, that's too near to this, this has to be there. I think this balloon would be more effective if it were more isolated. I think maybe what you're describing comes into play there. And those are the things that make you make those value judgments. You, Jim, you were describing working on a painting and that it's like a, it sounded like a torturous process for you. Is that always the case when you're working in color? Like, cause Sean's po poking at this idea of line. Um, is, is it always a more laborious kind of tortured process when you're working in painting and color and easier in line? Or is that just the particular it, image? It just depends. I haven't painted in a long time and I'm not a painter. I'm an image maker. And so um, I don't, quite have an understanding of how to do it. 
if I painted a couple more, then I would be more in control. But I think it's partly because I'm coming to this from a, you know, for the, for the first time in years, painting. Okay. That's probably the main reason. But also, it's it's typical of of uh, the drawings and paintings that I do. It's 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 a struggle to get them, and I never. Sometimes I feel that I've really rung the bell and I've gotten exactly what I wanted, but that doesn't happen half the time. The rest of the time I think, oh, this is as close as I'm going to get. I just have to live with this, not quite resonating the way that I want it to. So, uh, but that, that kind of thing doesn't happen with the Frank stuff. When I, when I commit to Frank, I know I've got it. The drawing may not quite be the way that I like. Some of that I drew when I was in the slough of despond over politics, and I don't yeah. think that stuff shines quite as brightly as it might. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if I don't think I have it right, then I don't let it out with Frank. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that's interesting to me about your your technique is that, you know, it, in my estimation anyway, you know, I, I think you're being much too humble about your, your charcoal and paint technique and that you have a very, I mean, your technique in paint and charcoal is just as specific as your ink technique in the sense that I could recognize one of your drawings or paintings from, you know, three or four feet away uh, and know it was yours regardless of the subject. Um, and and the only sort of commonality, I mean, they're so drastically graphically different. And if you haven't seen it, uh, Fan Graphics put out a collection of Jim's uh, charcoal drawings, um, oh, it was uh, 2004, I think. Um, Long time ago. Yeah, um, but the the if you haven't um, the the only thing that's really a commonality in terms of the technique because you know you you've got such a developed technique in these two sort of modes that are sort of separated by this you know gulf here uh, are are the approach to value um, and in the sense that if you were to take one of your uh, you know your pen and ink drawings and you know blur it enough that you're reducing it purely to values. Uh, and not seeing any of the hard edges at all, you get a very similar kind of, you know, you, you, you seem to have a very personal set of value relationships that communicate regardless of the medium that you're in, uh, which is, you know, stunning. I mean, frankly, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's stunning that you can have that similar kind of uh, tone, uh, I mean, tone in a value sense um, across different mediums with such drastically different techniques. Uh, I mean, do you, do you think a lot about value? I and mean, do you feel like, oh, this is not quite right. I need something darker here. Or I need something lighter. Oh, yeah. yeah, but but my my uh, rendering skills are pretty rudimentary. I'm not very, you know, I, 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 I consider myself a cartoonist. And a lot of my drawings, even the, the more realistic looking ones, if you look at them closely, there is a, or not closely, there's a, there is a cartoony element to them. Okay. I really, there's something about my work that I think keeps it from being quite fine art because there is, and I can think of other, other artists, contemporaries of mine who are terrific painters they can do really beautiful work. They're much more accomplished than I am, but because their work is rooted in some way in cartooning, it just misses being fine art. There's an inescapable, how shall I, it's not a frivolity, but a sense, I, I think there's a sense of, well, if this person is trying to say something important, why are they doing it in this kind of semi-cartoony way? There's a certain conflict there. I think well, if somebody was looking at the Dutch masters in a modern lens, they would they would have a similar kind of, uh, you know, uh, take because the you know e the, there's something about drawing from the personal well that results in things being similar to the to the foundational experiences. I mean, I think any, basically anything after photography is sort of polluted by the photo, um, and you know, I I. I, I don't I don't see your your work as more cartoony than you know the Bruegels or uh, you know <laughs> I mean if we're gonna we could go back that you know that that far um, in, in the sense that you have a sort of personal iconography that you're you're bringing to all of your different images but it's interesting that you you fight that or that you feel like maybe you should fight that. No, I, I'm not. I'm just analyzing it. It's yeah. just quality that is there, and I I I, I know that 
that quality prevents people, um, for example, yeah. Robert Hughes, who had tremendous admiration for R. Crumb, mm. didn't feel the same way about the other underground cartoonists, regardless of how accomplished they were and regardless of how much you and I might be dazzled by them. His criteria were not satisfied, I think, because there's something of the underlying joke to it all, and that made it hard to take seriously. Very interesting. The, yeah. There is a there because I went from like wanting to be a comic artist, spending my whole life on that to pretty quickly veering into for like a 15 year period, just being a painter. And for almost the entire time I was painting, I feel like I was composing like someone who grew up on comics. There was something about the composition and only right before I quit and moved back to comics did I get a couple compositions that all of a sudden felt like paintings and then um the the one that i really felt like i made a fine art painting i was the one that won in that that big like uh like um academic realist competition mm -hmm. it, it got it placed third in this like international kind of portraiture competition really and I'm it like was that it was that thing that i think you're describing that there's something about it for me it seemed compositionally related where I finally made a fine art composition versus my other painting seemed like to have that kind of comic book thing to them. And, and yeah, they we're too like, exciting, Carson. <laughs> yeah. I, I, but it's the same with Jim's work. It's almost like too, too lively or something. It's not austere enough that, and that separates it somehow. It could be that uh, one of the major influences, especially in my charcoal work is uh Boris Artsebashev, a Russian-American illustrator. He is, I grew up in a very kind of conservative household and I didn't see a lot of outlandish artwork growing up, but um, I did see illustrations by Boris Artsebashev and they were exactly what I wanted to do. Very clear, very crisp presentation. See, there's some right oh. You can see wow, yeah. rip this guy off, lock, stock, and barrel. But Good. but but the, the staging is it's not at all naturalistic. It's it's not a, so much a composition as it is a way of presenting the elements of the picture in such a way that they can be read with maximum ease. Mm, yeah. It's, they're very diagrammatic, very clear, very plain. You get a direct and immediate read. Right. That's that's what I've that's always been for me the, the, the highest achievement of imaginative drawing where you can do something that has such authority yeah he's he's the he was great and be so strange <laughs> while also making so much sense that's got to be a really hard did like, he work in animation he he did uh he did a lot of well he was an illustrator he uh, uh -huh. did ads he did uh a lot of work for Time Magazine and, uh, and other magazines. He uh, did a lot of the, the, his anthropomorphic machines were done. They were commissions by uh, various industrial concerns. I mm. think the robot there, the thinking robot, I think that was an illustration he did for Esquire. Huh. And one thing that's interesting about him is that a lot of his illustrations are in color. They're paintings, yeah. but when they get translated into black and white, they read perfectly as if they were composed in black and white and that's mm -hmm. magical that's incredible. yeah yeah that's quite and that's I, quite amazing I, I you know i would have gone to like eve tan guy or some uh, of those more fine art surrealists when i'm looking at your your charcoal work but when i see something like this i get what you're saying like there's a different lineage that's kind of mm -hmm. in the mix there um, I've never thought about it so explicitly. That's interesting. I'm going to be mulling that over for a while, like think, what what that difference really is. And and I think some of these things are uh, sort of the underlying, I mean, American class unacknowledgement. They're they're at least in in terms of like uh, I, I've been thinking for a while about why it is why do we still talk about, for instance, the watercolors of uh, oh I'm, I'm going to forget the name of my favorite watercolorist at this moment. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, who? Sargent. 
Oh, yes. Thank you. John Singer Sargent. <laughs> yeah, you've been uh, putting him into the AI for like a month now, Sean. <laughs> yeah. uh, why, why, why do we still talk about uh, John Singer Sargent's uh, watercolors, but we don't talk about uh, Gibson's pen and ink drawings? Why has Gibson fallen from the conversation when him and Sargent were contemporaries who had roughly the same level of fame and uh, level of sort of import in terms of the conversation at the moment. And I don't think it's because one has inherent qualities that the other doesn't have. There's something presentational about it that fell out uh, class wise almost. I mean, I, I think it might almost be like a kind of class issue where something evokes this sort of hidden, you know, class uh, aspect that Americans don't, you know, it's out of favor to talk about then it, it's not it's not engaged with in the same kind of way or doesn't get carried over generationally in an educational setting. Um, I'm, I don't I, I know this is just kind of tangential to this to this, but I, I think it's sort of related. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Why are some things remembered and some not in, in uh, Gibson's case, it may be that his work was so tied up with the fashions of the day and the social attitudes of the day that they don't communicate with us the way a sergeant painting of a fountain does, which is unvarying. I, th exactly. I feel the same way about John Hill Jr., such a marvelous cartoonist, but you, to look at his work is always to go into the past and think about the 20s. Right, and I suppose if somebody actually motive, um, you know, changed and modified, I mean, he, you know, Gibson is such a figure in that particular time that he's essentially not just documenting but creating a lot of the fashion movements that that is basically consigning him to be part of that decade or yeah. series of decades interesting he was on held he was uh, people aped his cartoons the flappers and sheiks wanted to look like the way he drew them <laughs> yeah whereas like sergeant you're going to get a guy on a canoe like enjoying <laughs> you know like nature which probably is is more relevant now than ever in terms of aspirational now in, in, instead of documentarian. Uh, well, I'm just I saying like, I wish I was, like, I like wish I was sitting this, on like, that unspoiled hill. <laughs> yeah, this need to like get out, disconnect from the computer, go out to that canoe. I don't know, I just been seeing in my students um, every semester, I, I have them do some automatic drawing um, and, uh, and also pick some objects. And this semester has all been plants hmm. uh, that they've picked. And and their their ear earbuds, so they're either tuning in and tuning out, or they want to get out in nature, which is what I've seen. So hmm. Sergeant might have that kind of broad appeal to like just getting out. It's interesting if if you're into cartoons and you understand the vocabulary and what's going on. It's astonishing how much great work is is invisible nowadays. Like Buster Brown, my out cult. Those comics are brilliant and seen in the context of their day they're transgressive and insanely funny but people have they're so far removed from signifiers today that i don't think people can understand them without a tutorial explaining what's going on here that makes this so great even though the drawing itself is funny you know tig drawings of tig foaming at the mouth and dancing on his hind legs that's just inherently funny well, I mean, that's the problem with symbolism, too, is those things are going to shift, right? Like, I mean, a, a Renaissance painting was packed full of some kind of symbolisms that were e easily interpretive. And now there's some asshole like me walking into a classroom teaching art history that's like, this is what a rose meant back then. <laughs> so you lose that. Yeah, that's, um, that's valid. And, and that's I, I mean, I think that's something that we're all going to have to deal with. And, and you you hope, you know, that something like Frank has a symbolism that endures right for quite a long time. Um, and I think with the surrealism, you're kind of able to tap into that. It's it's not so locked to a now, uh, especially with the strange shapes and that you yeah. get. You're you're speaking to something hopefully um that has more longevity. And yet I wonder, you know, when I, the first time I ever saw surrealism, I was in high school, I was so closed off and out of it that I didn't know who Salvador Dali was. Mm. And, and compassionate friends took me to a huge retrospective of surrealism and Dada at the LA County Art Museum. And I went in there totally unprepared. 
really closed off, really messed up, terribly sexually repressed, completely out of it in so many ways. And I had been trying to make spooky art and I'd been connected to that and I'd had my head down so much I didn't know this world existed. And when I saw it, the first, I mean, it all just cooked my brain. What year was this uh, exhibit? Because I, I, ha I have a connection for you uh, that, that's very interesting. Do you, was this like 66, 67? 68. 68. It was, it was the exact 68. Okay. So I, I don't know if, if you uh, have uh, read uh, John French's autobiography, the drummer for... Uh, no, uh, I know who he is, but I haven't read him. Uh, okay. Yeah. So John French uh, was the drummer for Captain... Oh, Dolly's car. Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. yeah. So... The, uh, John French was the drummer for Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band, and he was the transcriber during this period of time when they made uh, Trout Mask Replica. So he would take, he was the keeper of the parts. He would write down all of the different parts and sort of assemble it. And he talks about in his biography that the pivotal moment for making Trout Mask, the origins of the methodology that they came up with, this is basically one of the oddest and, you know, most influential you know, works of art of that past century uh, was when they went together as a band to visit that exhibition. Um, and, uh, you know, there was one particular song composed about the car that was uh, there on the roof. Uh, but the entire experience of going there was basically what pointed them in the direction of you can do anything that you want to do. Um, you know, and what they wanted to do was, you know, something that nobody had ever done before. Um, so I mean, you right. know, I think that's quite amazing that that's that was you know your your formative experience as well. Um, yeah, yeah, and I was a huge Beefheart enthusiast. I got Trout Mask Replica on the day it came out. And, <laughs> really? Yeah, and Dali's car and so I thought, oh, that's cool. And it never occurred to me that that was a specific reference to the Rainy Taxi at that show. Right at that very show that you were at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I found out about that later. Yeah, that's interesting. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is. That was a hell of a show. It's a greatest hit show. I mean, think of any Dada or Surrealist guy, and their ten greatest works were there. And that, yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah. The the moment they they reference in the in the book, you know, John French has got an incredible memory, and he writes about these things in very vivid detail. And he talks about uh, him and Don Van Vliet uh, examining the uh, the snails that were there, and how they were both. Uh, real snails <laughs> that, you know, were growing in this disgusting, humid environment, and also fake snails that had been filled with uh, oil paint that had been squeezed out directly. Oh, uh, I didn't and, notice that. I noticed that it was crawling with snails. And that there, <laughs> there heads of lettuce in there to feed the snails, but I didn't notice any snails filled with paint. That's interesting. They got right up on it and we're, we're just looking right up into this, you know, phony snail like filled with just squeezed out oh, oil paint. I didn't see that. Yeah, you could walk right up to it and put your head in the window. It was sitting out in the plaza. Yeah, that was, well, that's fascinating. It's an explosive oh, thing, you know, and I, I think about impact events like that. This show, I mean, you know, and I, I don't want to over, overstate it for you. Obviously, you're the person who had the experience, but this show, you know, seemed to have birthed mul multiple you know, art excursions that lasted decades, you know? Oh, it was a major event, major cultural event. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like your your new book, you know, has a, you know, the, the scale, I mean, obviously, how many people are going to go every day, read, you know, read it is different, but I, I think that it has an opportunity to be a similar kind of thing in that there is so many deep kinds of things that people can take out of it. And the experience of reading it is such a profound one uh, that people are going to be moved to make, you know, their own art and, uh, you know, not like copying what you've done here, but this is a major achievement. I mean, I, I really, I feel like this is something that's going to be around with us for a very long time. Well, that's a nice thought. Thanks. Um, needless to say, it would be it would be wonderful if this book meant something to people to that extent. I hope it does. Well, we've well, got I two. Mean, <laughs> no, sorry, go ahead, Sean. No, there's two of us, uh, you know, right right here anyway. Uh, so well, I, I was I was going to say, uh, I don't know if you've seen his work, but we've talked to a fantastic new up and coming cartoonist, Andy Barron, um, who like obviously has been extremely impacted by your work and then kind of like filtered it through his own vision. So I know, like, I was just thinking about like an immediate impact I already know of. Yeah. 
Oh, what's his name? Baron? And, Andy, Andy Baron. He has a series called Ohm um, oh, okay. that, that has a good. similar like cartoon character let loose in a surreal world. Oh, okay. I'll check that out. Type of structure. Yeah. He, he actually owns some of your uh, original artwork. Uh, I was, we, we had to str struggle mightily to not talk about it at the, at the start of the uh, interview with him because it was sitting right behind his head. Uh, <laughs> well, thanks. And, and when Sean said you recognize it immediately, like from a distance, yeah, that one little small, I was surprised to see how small it was too. I was surprised your work was so small, but to see that in the background is immediately like, I know that. <laughs> yeah, what what that size happened. original are you at uh, these days, Jim? Uh, uh, well, it depends. Here's one. This is something in progress. Wow. Big. Wow. I don't even know, I couldn't see through it. So and that looks like a charcoal. No, it's it's pen and ink. It's oh, wow. twenty six okay. by sixteen inches. Okay. And uh, the pages I do for the comic are about eight by twelve. Gotcha. Size. So it's all. Bit and so the the reduction is much less on this uh, new edition than the previous. Yeah, yeah. Which like ninety percent or something like that. Something like that. Yeah, it's much bigger than the previous books. Right. Well, I'm glad I got that one, man. I got the big one. <laughs> well, I, actually, one thing I wanted to know is is for, for people who, like me, I've seen your work in bits and pieces here and there, but I've never had the collections. This is the first, like, collected edition I have. Um, and so when I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, okay, it's got these three that have been collected and then filled in. Are there other things, like, in the Frank world that I need to get, like, the Fran book, or is that like for someone who's coming into it new? What what what's like if you get one beautiful spring day? Plus, is there anything else you need, or is that like the the statement? Well, there's, there's a collection called the Frank book, three hundred okay. pages of short Frank stories, and there's a book called Weathercraft, which is a hundred page standalone book. And uh, there's a book called Seeing Things, which is drawings and paintings. And those are the main ones. Okay. That would round out the collection if you got the beautiful spring day. Yeah, there's a lot of other stuff floating around out there, but those are the, I guess, the most, the major books. There's also a nice collection of sketchbook drawings called Problematic. Okay. And there's a book that's unfortunately out of print already of 3D renderings of some of my drawings. Mm -hmm. Oh, that would be and cool. Charles Bernard. And that's that was that's a great book, but unfortunately it's out of print now. And uh, do you still have uh, those of you guys who have not uh, seen this? Uh, Jim was uh, on a project. I mean, it must have lasted at least a, a year or two to build a giant dip pen. Uh, and so Jim had a, a it's amazing. It's always a six foot. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's right here. Actually. Oh, you, you have it with you. Can we see it? <laughs> Whoa. Oh, my God. That's it. Can you see it? It's yeah. Fantastic. And you can draw with that? Yeah, I had a whole show of enormous drawings at the Fry Art Museum. Yeah. Oh, my God. And not only can you draw, can Jim draw with it, but they look exactly <laughs> like his drawings in reduction. I mean, yeah. I was just stunned. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> stunned. We have one in the living room of our house and it's like three by six feet. And next to it is the postcard reproduction of it. And it, the, it, the, the postcard just looks like a drawing that size. They reduce strangely. Yeah, well, I mean, that was genius because you're getting your exercise while you're working. I'm, I'm got to learn how to draw that way, that's genius. And in fact, I, when I was doing it, I thought, okay, now my hand is my whole body. My arms and my fingers and my legs are my wrist. And I had to think about that in order to move around the drawing board and do these things. Were, were you above or was it on a wall? It was on a, I made a tilting drawing table. And I set myself a, a process for these. I said, only no mechanical aids at all. Just drawing, drawing and pencil will be freehand. And all the inking will be done with the pen. Nothing else. No other conveyance for the ink and no whiteout or corrections whatsoever. Uh, 
just pure pen and ink on these big, huge drawings. And it worked out really well. I, I did a couple of them. I rolled them up and took them to the Fry Art Museum because I knew the director was leaving. And I said, I'm not asking for a show because I know you're going away. But as you go through the world, I want you to remember that I'm doing these drawings. And she said, well, actually, we're having a, a uh, Archipenko show and we're looking for a pendant for it. So if you'd like to have it, if you can do 10 more of these, well, show them. I said, okay. <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was a but pleasure. you're you're crossing into like the fine art, fine art world there for sure, because you have artists like Matthew Barney with his. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he had oh, his drawing familiar. restraint series. Very familiar. Yeah, that seems similar to me, like a, a restraint on the drawing. Yeah, except his his you know he's an athlete, and his restraints are a lot more vigorous. Yeah. He really subjects himself to some strange forces in those drawing restraints. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it and has it has that tugging, same tugging at various aspects of him all the time. So well, but, I like the, the the discipline aspect of it, you know. One of the things, speaking of surrealism, was I discovered what a fraud Salvador Dali turned into. I was so disappointed. <laughs> like when I was young, I was so into him. I read The Secret Life, and I still have dreams that I'm at, at a restaurant with him and I'm begging, I'm hoping I can get a little drawing out of him, but I never do. I've had that recurring dream for years and years. <laughs> and then, but then when I realized at a certain point, you know, wow, he did his last great drawing about 1939. Right. And after that, you can see drawings in his over or paintings where there will be three paintings that aren't painted by him. Some assistant did these Dali lookalikes. And then later on, you know, when he went from being a hard-edged miniaturist to a man who could paint 15 by 15 foot canvases with the skill of uh, you know, Rubens or something, it never occurred to me to think somebody else did these. He didn't yeah. sort of turn into a scenery painter overnight here. So when I realized the extent of his dishonesty, I thought, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be dishonest. I'm not going to have assistance or say that something is something when it isn't i'm going to be completely honest and straightforward as much as i can i'm not going to try to hoodwink anybody it does it, seem to have veered towards warhol as he went without having a framework to to follow that yeah and i think he just was you know he just loved to live his crazy expensive life and uh, later yeah. on you know somebody would show up with a briefcase full of money and say you can have this hundred and forty thousand dollars if you'll do if you mark up these old prints of yours for me, or yeah. whatever it was. It, it seems like the autographic uh, aspect of of the work is very important to you personally, Jim. Uh, I I remember one of the times that I, I had the impression that I deeply offended you by uh, making a cursory comment. Uh, I I I, uh, I said something about uh, whether you thought the Hernandez brothers uh, would be the same if they had hired out somebody else to make the ticky marks on the walls. <laughs> behind the characters and and uh, and I remember like just obviously you were just like no <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they wouldn't yeah. do that <laughs> what's wrong with you <laughs> yeah. I remember one time I was asked to forge an artist's signature on some prints with their permission they couldn't do it and they said can you just forge this guy's name on these prints here and I said no these people are buying this thing and they're getting this thing it would be ripping them off how can you even suggest this you crook <laughs> So the, well, the, no, is, ahead, is it Sean. because the, the 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 mark itself is infused with the person? Is it you know is there some kind of like soft line there that you could cross? Like you know maybe not really, maybe not really. But you know I have you can't see them, but I have some some nice drawings in here. I've got a John Tenniel drawing and a Claire Briggs and a Shukalski and a Jack Davis, and those are meaningful to me because they did them. I can look at John Tenniel's pencil lines and. You know, I know he did them. And, yeah. it, you know, when people say, oh, does it really matter as long as you like, they're talking about AI. And people right. say, well, AI is just another tool. Yeah, that's that's in a way that's true that it is, you know, and I've, and it seems like it's learning how to do it better and better. You know, somebody sent me a picture of a cat wearing 16th century armor. And at first it looks like the most brilliant, perfect illustration you've ever seen and then you look at the filigree in the armor and it's like got that crazy mindless clouds of jupiter feeling to it that doesn't say or mean or do anything no recognizable 
decorative motifs, just this message from this mindless world. And it's fascinating, but it's also, to me, as a connoisseur of drawing and art, valueless. It's taken things that other people have done and melded them in this interesting seamless way, but it's a trick. It's totally and, parasitic and dependent and it's dazzling, but it's nothing. The same reason, you know, computer effects and movies, you know. When I was a kid, I loved monster movies and I would have sold my soul to see a movie like uh, well, some CG sci-fi extravaganza where all the monsters are perfect and atmospheric. But after a while, there's no nutrition in it. There's nothing to yeah. admire. You just know it's an army of people massaging these things until they look as good as they can get. And it's, it misses a crucial element for me. There's, a, there's an aspect of connoisseurship where not everything is the same. Not everything goes. There's things I like. And if they're not there, I don't value it as much. Somebody was, you know, our crumb loves to render and he will get a big complicated picture and trace it, trace out the outlines of all the people in this crowd and then he'll render them in. And people will say, well, so what if he traced it? It doesn't, if he still created this great drawing, does it matter how he did it? And I think, yes, it does. Because if he had done this freehand, then he would be an even greater artist than he actually is. And I think that's significant. Yeah. So it just depends on what you get out of it. Right. And, and I think you're definitely right about the AI stuff. It, its value, if it has value, is that we are receiving a transmission from this nothingness. Um, and it gives you as a person an opportunity to recognize your own narcissism when you see reflected back to you in an in a amalgamated nonsensical way the things that you enjoy and right. have asked for. And, yeah. and Sean, no, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm done. Oh, uh, I was going to say, Sean has speculated a few times that we may get to the point where like really all that's left in popular culture, at least for artists, is the performative aspect. So I was thinking about your gigantic pin um, and are we going to be reduced to like, you know, we can't discern once these things get better if a real person made it or, you know, that that kind of who did it, how they did it only becomes interesting if it's verifiable. I saw him do it. He had this big six right. foot pin. And now you find yourself wondering, you know, you look at some great image, you go, how much of this is, did he paint that cloud or did he just drop it in there? And another aspect of this, the talismanic, talismanic aspect of drawing is uh, when I first made that pen, I went to give an interview about it down at Cafe Racer down the street yeah. from my house where Sean and I used to meet. And I was walking down the street carrying this pen on my shoulder and three, <laughs> three middle-aged women came out of their houses and said, is that a giant pen? I went to art school. I learned how to use one of those. Can I see this? Wow. Oh my God, does it work? And I thought, God, I should have done this when I was in my 20s. This is amazing, <laughs> you know? You got to show that big pen. <laughs> yeah, that's mightier than the sword. There's, there's, uh, there's just something about that. My wife said I should put this machine really does kill fascists. <laughs> it really could kill fascists because it, you could. But, uh, you know, it's, there's just that's part of the whole thing, you know, that this really was a pen. It wasn't, here's a drawing, AI made this thing. I put in giant pen drawing and look what it made. That's not anywhere near as interesting as the actual pen and the process of making it. And it, by, by, enjoying that kind of thing getting into that kind of thing it's like going to hear live music or something there is a human essence to it that makes it that gives you something you just don't get from the empty mask i often wonder if a person who had to live on ai art and ai literature if they just go crazy if we just make the brain spin around as they churn this meaningless verbiage and imagery over and over, you know, I mean, would they, would they get sick? Would they get scurvy, you know, from not getting their nutrients? Mental scurvy. Mental That's scurvy. a new one. That's dangerous. Yeah. Well, I just wonder, I mean, maybe we're seeing it to some extent. I'm sure that all of this, is it real? Is it not real? Is it good? Is it bad? Who cares how it's made as long as it's interesting? That, that whole attitude towards life and artifact and everything else I must have had an effect on people in general, the way people think and see things, what they require. I think 
something like that might be behind the fact that people regard phone calls as invasive now. Mm, yeah. They'd rather go the rather have the computer as an intermediary. So yeah. they don't have to deal with the awkwardness of a human being calling them at the wrong time. It's all manageable. The humanity doesn't matter so much as not having to answer the phone if you don't want to. That's spooky to me. I don't like it. It, I, I think that you're you are you're tapping into this change and it's interesting that the AI is essentially facilitating this change that was already on the horizon we essentially had a two decade slow shift um, when, when uh, my wife and I met each other uh, in, in, this is back in uh, 2012 uh, we started busking uh, together I, I uh, and and the the feedback that we got from unamplified production of sound only the sounds that we were capable of making together uh, at the same time just the two of us was nothing like any show that i'd ever played before uh, it was the response to it was nothing like anything like that because every time you you if you were listening to a recording you're listening through a mediary uh, all of the different tricks and techniques that somebody uses to record something and everything is in an, there's an intermediaries between you and the and the person. Uh, if you perform with amplification, the amplification and the volume itself acts as an intermediary. When you're playing for someone directly in front of them, there is no intermediary and it's the intimate connection, a, an accidental intimate connection that is scary uh, to people, but is also kind of thrilling, you know, and it, it seems like there's an opportunity for visual performance in the same kind of way that would not just be like I'm a performing monkey. Um, here's my trick that I can do, but also perhaps engages people in that same kind of unmediated uh, direct line. Uh, you know, I mean, I feel like that way about print books, um, personally. Uh, but, you know, that's because I have a lifetime of print accumulation that has trained me to see this your mark communicated to me through a printing press as still being your mark. Um, I like that. But I, I think your your facility uh, and, and the particular techniques that you've chosen to use bring that to, to bear in a really strong kind of way. I said the first time I saw you draw with the big pen when it was finally complete, complete I was like, it's a big gym. You know, <laughs> like it, you, you made the same drawing on a different scale. And similarly, uh, when Frank is drawn close up, if you were to take and blow up a small Frank, he has the, the same line thickness approximately as the close up Frank. Approximately. It's hard for me to get that right, but I appreciate that. Well, I, I wondered if that was that was an intellectual decision that you made at some point or whether that was something you just noticed that you were doing, because it seems profound to me. Yeah, you know, something I try to do. I, I try to keep the scale intact. So right. So close to something, the line work is close. Right. So, for instance, like if we see Frank in the middle distance uh, and and he's drawn with a thinner line and then we with the, but with the same amount of taper and then you see Frank in a close up and his line is commensurately thicker. Right. Yeah. It has the same the same characteristic to the taper, almost as if his rendering is part of his selfness. Right. Um, his his physicality is the the marks that you have the expression of him is the marks that you have made to express him. Well, that's true. I do try to do that. And I think it adds to the sense of it being real somehow. Like when you close, of course, when you come in close, it's going to, the lines are going to be thicker. So yeah, it's part of the verisimilitude. Yeah. And that, that, that connection to like the, the person making it, like you said, you have these drawings and you know, they made it. I think that was uh, part of what I was trying to ask after earlier where I was saying like the difference between the kind of spiritual impact of making something versus consuming it. And this AI stuff seems to be pushing us towards just the consumption because you're taking out the making, you're taking out the, the middle and the knowing of the, the making seems to be really important. There's um, no performance if, you know, sorry. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, I'm, we must be in a transitional phase. I mean, things are changing on so many levels so rapidly and who knows where it's all going to land. I'm sure the land, the things will look much different in 10 years than they do now in ways we can't even predict. Everything's happening so fast. And you know, in a lot of ways, I, I think it's really good, all these changes that are occurring. I think that humanity is simultaneously improving itself and also trying to destroy itself. It's hard to tell which one we're gonna succeed at. 
uh, or if it'll be both simultaneously. It's a gambit, <laughs> for sure. Well, it's the it's like the the choice we all have to face on a personal level every day. So it's it's all about individuals. You know, what will we do? How will we respond? I'm I'm I don't know how many years I have left. So at this point, for me, the experience consists of I'll go out and I'll see some young people hanging around, and I think, man, if I was them, I would hate my guts. I would look over and see this fatuous old bum sitting here and eating his hamburger and just sort of bovinely enjoying life, you know, while I've created this horrible, lousy world for these poor people <laughs> to try to get along in, you know, I would, I would hate the sight of somebody like me if I was a young person today. I hated the sight of old people when I was young and everything was relatively good. Yeah. You can't imagine the kind of anger and desperation young people feel right now. It must be terrible. Does does your inner like 14 year old hate your current self? I struggle with that every now and then. I, I look at myself from that viewpoint and go, ah, oh, who's that like old boring yeah. white dude? <laughs> no, because I've always been I my my exterior aspects, my understanding has changed, lots of me has changed, but the core person, I can look down my life and it's an open corridor and I can see right almost to when I was born. I haven't huh. gone, undergone any major twists and turns, just a lot of surface learning. Interesting. You're very I'm lucky. Because like old me looks back at young me and says, you were just a fool about certain things. And oh, then yeah. young me looks at old me and are like, well, you're a sellout and you're boring. <laughs> and, you know. Oh, I think if young me could see me now, he would be thrilled. Because, you know, I'm 70. And when I was 14, if I imagined somebody was 70, it was just like, they're not even human. There's some kind of relic with a 10 watt light bulb shining inside somewhere and they, I can't relate to them, you know, they're so old and horrible. And the idea that, you know, at this age, I still feel basically the way I did when I was 14 about the world and life and everything else, you know, most of my attitudes about things haven't changed much. And, um, you know, Jim, I, I, I feel like I, I I, I'm I'm worried that I'm going to open up a whole other thing, and I don't I don't want to I don't want to do that because obviously we you know we've been we've been intensely going at it for a while here, but I I, I want to I've always wanted to ask you about your first experiences as an animator and if that was an educational experience for you and and if so what kind of education? Well, I was never an animator. Okay. I was uh, I had a friend who worked at Ruby Spears, my best friend was the head of the storyboard department and he gave me a job there. Okay. So I drew storyboards and I colored presentation artwork. And uh, so I never did animation per se. Okay. And uh, it was that job was so cushy and paid so well that I was able to do my own work on the side. It was while I was doing that that I did Gym Magazine and got that whole side thing going, so. So mostly it was uh, it was fun. It was a fun job, but in terms of being any kind of training or you know, I never wanted to work in that field. Even even you know even if I could have gotten a job at a good animation studio, which I couldn't have because I didn't have the skills or the team spirit, I wouldn't have wanted to because uh, I had something else I wanted to do with my life. And if you're going to be an animator, that's a yeah a lot of work and dedication i just didn't want to devote myself to that did, would, did you as a younger person meeting somebody like gil kane and jack kirby um and you know seeing the skills that they had in possession was that uh you know of themselves was that at all influential for you well i never read superhero comics when i was a kid and the reason Gil Kane and Jack Kirby and Alfredo Alcala and Alex Toth and guys like that worked at Ruby Spears is because John Dorman hired them. At least he hired Gil Kane and Jack Kirby. And uh, so I knew that Jack Kirby was a famous cartoonist and that Gil Kane was. And I, I didn't, their work was lying all around. I never took any of it home, you know? It just didn't mean that much to me. I would ink in Jack Kirby drawings and I would think, this guy is insane. Let's look at this drawing here. Look at this, 
but it didn't mean anything to me. I wasn't like, oh, <laughs> on the work by the great Jack Kirby. It was just, I'm doing the inking in this eccentric comic artist's work. And Gill's work was just completely beyond me. He was such a master technician when it came to drawing the human body. I would just look at that and go, forget it. I'll never get close to that. Right. But Bill Gill was like he was a he was a sort of a mentor and a father figure to me. He he gave he could see I needed it I think and he gave me a lot of life lessons, hmm. told me a lot of interesting things, showed me a lot of interesting things. It just it the the contrast uh, the thing that always has struck me about the Ruby Spears, uh, you know, environment, uh, out of remove obviously having you know. It's just the the contrast between the immense skill of the people who must have, who worked there uh, and the actual product, and it's it, it's it's such a huge gap. It's it's <laughs> almost astounding, you know. Yeah. I used to say it was like buying racehorses to chop up into dog food. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, when Ruby Spears broke up, everybody there but me went on to a stellar position in the animation industry. Um, one guy went on to be a producer at The Simpsons. One guy went on to be a, a directing animator at Disney. Uh, somebody else went on to be the head of color at, uh, at uh, Spielberg's outfit, whatever that was. And I mean, people, they were all really, really good. And they were able to get much better jobs than they had at Ruby Spears. But it was so much fun working there. Right. We had an unconscionable amount of fun. <laughs> There's a book in it. The stuff that we did there it was remarkable. It's amazing that you bring talent and fun together and that doesn't produce. Like you would think that would be like the recipe for talent and fun. Just and then let, let them do that and you're going to get something amazing. So there must have been some kind of oversight that was holding it all back. Well, it was uh, Joe Ruby and Ken Spears. Uh, Joe Ruby was the, I think, the, the creative end of it. And he uh, he wanted everything to be according to his sensibilities. He wasn't one of those guys who would say, oh, you're talented. Let's see what you come up with. He, I think he wanted to control everything. Oh, that's too bad. John and I created a show because we thought it would be interesting. We wrote a script. We did storyboards. We did big stand-up marquees of the figures and gave it to him. He said, "Here, Joe. Here's a present. You want? The, here's a show for you to have. We don't want anything. We're just giving this to you because we think it would be fun to do." And he, you know, I don't think he even considered it for a second because it wasn't his. Mm, right. He considered himself a, an artist and a creative person, and he wanted to do his own thing like we all do. It, it's like it's like a hothouse for you know it, it's the missing connective tissue between some of the greatest graphic novels of our time and turbo teen you know it's i i just can't you know it, it it's it's almost unfathomable you know it's going to be one of those things that you know it's like a reverse of the uh 1968 dolly show yeah well <laughs> there are some interesting side effects uh Jack Kirby would bring in pitch artwork. He would just think of show ideas, draw them up on big sheets of crescent board with a lumber pencil, I think, and bring them in. And then we would color them in and paint them in and they would be show pitched ideas. And I think for a long time, he thought that these shows might be made. Yeah. Like you might reasonably think, but he just kept bringing them in and nothing happened. And over time, his interest in making these things really good began to fade like it would when you yeah. realize there's no hope that they're going to be made. And one of the last things he did, I've told this story many times, was a character called Heidi Hogan. who was a lumberjack in a pinafore who was shown jumping off a cliff with a double-hedged axe. <laughs> I think that was Jack signaling that he had about enough. <laughs> Heidi Hogan. <laughs> uh, uh, unfortunate. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it was a beautiful drawing. It would have made a great show. I would have watched it. It would have made Rick and Morty look like Peter Rabbit. <laughs> I, I feel a little left out because I grew up uh, without a television. So I'm only like barely familiar even with what 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 the products were from that. I'll, I'll send yeah. There's lots, there's lots to, to catch up on, Carson. Yeah, you, you didn't miss anything. Yeah, I don't feel like I need to, but uh it's it's still fun to hear about. It's a little sad though to hear this that these guys like that 
I mean, God, just let him go. Let him go loose. What did we well, lose? Um, uh, it was a boon, you know. Uh, yeah. Gil was uh, not working in comics as he had been. He made a lot more money doing this. So did Jack. It was easy money for them both. And I, I think they enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. And like I say, we had a lot of fun. Well, uh, Jim, I, uh, I really just can't thank you enough for taking the time to, to talk to us and, and put up with our prodding. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, it, it, it means a lot to me. And uh, I, it just your, your new book is just really quite stunning. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to rereading it uh, many, many more times in the upcoming uh, months. So thank, thank you for doing this. Well, it's been my pleasure. I've enjoyed talking to you guys, you know sitting here in the studio day in and day out without anybody to talk to uh, makes something like this a real treat. So thank you. Thanks for Pick it up, everybody. One beautiful spring day. We've got a nice uh, reveal here. I'm going to pop this off so you can see what's hiding. All underneath. those lovely colors behind there. Yeah. That was colored by uh, Justin Allen Spencer, who art directed the book. One thing I really like about it is when you open it up, there's the title page and then there's the story. No indicia page, no, just boom, it hits the ground running. I think that's great. That actually had a lot of impact on me too, because uh, yeah, I was like, boom, okay, I'm in it. But then I did, I wanted to know who did the design on it. And I was like, where's the damn indicia page? And I was like looking around. Um, but I, I, I did like that choice, actually. Uh, that, that is maybe the best way to enter a book. Yeah, I thought it was great. The The hardcover edition isn't like that. The hardcover edition has got that color cover as an end paper and a different colored drawing as the rear end paper and a different cover. And it's also got a print which has been folded into quarters and put in an envelope and glued into the book. Is that out yet or is that come forthcoming? I, I, I don't think it's out yet, okay. but uh, they, it was my idea to make a print that is folded into quarters and stuck in an envelope. It's so kind of wrong and unsatisfying. It struck me as a real Jim Woodring idea. <laughs> yeah, you're uh, you're 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 purposely defacing this pristine thing that people want to put in a frame. <laughs> well, that's 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 part of it. I don't know. I, yeah. I just like the idea. I did a mural for Facebook, and of all the spaces I could have done it, I did it in a hallway. So you can't see the whole thing in one glimpse. You can't see it from a distance. And I thought that was really great because it was more interesting. It added layers of interest, but I think it just pissed everybody off. <laughs> Maybe this folded print will do the same. If I can be forgiven for telling one more uh, Jim story, uh, I, I just remember when you had it, when you, you first publicly talked about the idea of the of the big pen. It just seems so emblematic you know, of, of your sort of kind of art making. Uh, I, I remember one or two people just kind of saying like, well, there's going to be issues with this or that and sort of having like, like trying to have like a preemptive kind of like discussion about whether you're going to use oh, ink, you're going to do that. And I just remember how you, you just kind of were calmly just like, well, this is, you didn't, you didn't say anything. You were just kind of looked at him like, what? what well, do you I, knew about? It would work. I knew it would work. I knew enough about pens and how they work that I knew it would work. Right, and you were going to do it. I mean, it wasn't. It, it was. It was funny to me because it was. The question wasn't like, oh, I just knew that whatever things were going to be in your way, you were just going to change it until it was the thing that you needed it to be. You know, like that. You you were going to make the thing that you were going to make, and it didn't. You know, it, the obstacle was going to make itself apparent if there was one, and there wasn't. No, uh, there wasn't. I could see in advance how it would work, so it wasn't really much of a case of forging ahead through obstacles. I knew in advance that it would work. Um, anyway, I, 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 uh, I, I've thought about that, that moment a lot and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a source of inspiration for me. Uh, well, that's nice. So great to see you again, Sean. It's great to see you, Jim. All the best to you. Well, well thank you. You too. And, uh, thanks again for, for talking with us and I hope that, uh, everything is going well for you. So, you know, it's my pleasure. Nice to meet you, Carson. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jim. It's, it's a real, real honor to talk to someone who's, you know, just like, I don't know. There's a big shadow that you cast, and it's a real honor to talk to you. And it's 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 been a real treat. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Make sure to like, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell.